pest control New Zealand style where lamping wallaby and possum. Dressed for sporting success, we have the latest in our Best of British series where we're thinking tailoring. Not that I need to learn anything. We've got the latest on the news story that hits yesterday about the British government banning crow and pigeon shooting. We have the rest of the news and hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. There are lots of things that now call New Zealand home. Well, it's a nice place. But some are less welcome than others. Take the wallaby and the possum. Yes, we hear the Kiwis say, take the wallaby and the possum. Both have done well in the temperate climate with no natural predators breathing down their pouches. Wallabies alone cause 28 million New Zealand dollars worth of economic damage every year, and it's just going to get worse. So after a day spent with the Fraser family looking at their red deer farming practices on the South Island, Neil Rowntree of West Highland Hunting and Laurent Hua of Magic Safari Lodges are hoping to make a small dent in the local wallaby population. Nimish, what are we on tonight? Uh, we are going to do some pest control tonight. Yeah. We're going to uh, make sure that we're looking after our feed so that we can grow big stags. If we don't go and do what we do tonight, then we have a, uh, a big pest population of wallabies around here. So they need uh, management as well. Certainly when we were out and about today, so we saw Lovely. ourselves, there was basically there were wallabies everywhere. And I, I didn't realise till I came here how big a grazer they were. And uh, Marcus and Duncan and Hamish have explained to us how big a problem they are. So we thought, couldn't come all this way in, I'm going to have a look. <laughs> and it could be fun! <laughs> As well as competing for pasture, wallabies also eat young trees and indigenous plants, so a bit like a rabbit, just a three foot high one. That's one. You good? That's loud. Oh, okay. Still good? <laughs> the lamping setup is much the same as we would employ for foxing in the UK, but without a moderator. Laurent is on the rifle to start with, and if it goes well, we should account for more than 60 wallabies tonight. Shot! See that, David? Hamish spots a possum. He hates these cute looking Australian marsupials brought to New Zealand in 1837 to establish a fur trade. Shot. Now, an environmental disaster. Um, so these here are really tough on uh, all the native birds and they're also quite tough on all the native bush as well. The other issue for us is that they are one of the main carriers of tuberculosis. So these here are a big issue for transferring tuberculosis into both deer and cattle. So that's probably their main uh, economic issue for New Zealand. If you want to buy a possum throw for your bed, it'll cost you about 6,000 bucks. Wow. But you feel it and you understand why. Look at the, the feet in there. Oh mate, if you get caught with that, that'll rip you to bits. Wow. So there you go, those two there, the scourge of, uh, there are two big prep. Too big pest. Do you like Australians really? <laughs> <laughs> Don't like Australians, but I am half one. Oh, yeah. Can't kind of admit to it though. <laughs> Just as we call it a night, there's a chance of a third pest species, but the feral pig is too quick. 
dead. Uh, they like the possums they carry. It's been a fascinating oh, evening with some fun oh. shooting. Oh. It is a drop in the ocean when you start understanding the huge problem New Zealand faces controlling its pests. Thank you, the Frasers. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Laurent. You cannot beat a spot of pest control, unless, of course, your natural England. More on that story later. Now, if there were two of him, he'd be a plague. It is David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The British government is bowing to pressure from Chris Packham and is now banning most pigeon, crow, gull and Canada goose shooting in England. Charlie has a special report at the end of this bulletin, but for the updated story visit fchannel forward slash general licences. Now should gamekeepers be compulsory? A series of wildfires over the Easter weekend on unkeepered land in England has led some shooters to ask whether organisations such as the National Trust and local councils should be forced to employ gamekeepers because only gamekeeping techniques stop or reduce wildfires. This is Marsden Moor, a National Trust property in West Yorkshire, where more than 1,000 acres burnt. Also in Yorkshire, Ilkley Moor, now owned by Bradford Council, burned killing more grouse in a single day than a whole season of grouse shooting. Wildfires are also breaking out across Scotland, with questions being asked of local and national government. We're stood here in the Loch Sooner Oakwood. This project was funded and still is funded by taxpayers' money to deliver and restore native woodland around Loch Sooner. For many people, this is the epitome of rewilding. And yet, you can see the main problem they have is wildfire, which will be continually a threat to this sort of habitat vision for Scotland in the future. At the moment, an aircraft's required to put the fire out and a big commercial plantation behind us, and at the moment they're waiting on an available aircraft to deal with it. This is rewilding at its best. The Animal Liberation Front has slaughtered more pheasants. After cutting the wire on a game farm in Wiltshire in March and driving 5,000 pheasants to roost unprotected on the ground, where they're easy prey for foxes, the Animal Liberation Front has done the same for 9,000 birds in Suffolk. ALF claims it cut the wire at Heath Hatcheries in Suffolk during the Easter bank holiday weekend. It posted this video on the anti-badger cull page, Stop the Cull, on Facebook. The Times newspaper, once called the Thunderer, is engaged in a war of words over shooting with a 27-year-old YouTuber called Callum. A series of articles in the Times by chief reporter Sean O'Neill and responses on YouTube by Callum Long Collins of the English Shooting Channel stepped up a gear when Sean went to interview Callum and Callum surprised Sean by filming the interview and releasing parts of it online. I'm truly flattered that The Times thinks a three-year-old story about a YouTuber is newsworthy. This is just a continued attack on our sport by Sean O'Neill, a sport that is incredibly safe with 600,000 license holders and 2.5 million legally held firearms in the UK and yet no accidents. As a community, we need to unite against these attacks, otherwise they will continue to erode us piece by piece. Forestry England has introduced beavers to one of its woodlands to help prevent flooding. The government agency released a pair of Eurasian beavers from Scotland to Crompton Forest in Yorkshire to determine whether the creatures can slow flood water by building dams. It is the first trial of its kind. Meanwhile, beavers are thriving on the River Tay in Scotland, with this beaver turning up dead in Tayport. A hunting YouTuber from New Zealand claims he was shot at by a farmer. Gun safety. I just want to make a point about gun safety. In a film posted on Facebook, the popular Josh James Kiwi Bushman says the farmer shot at him and a friend while they were hunting on public land. He reported the man to the police, but says they have done nothing and asks, should they respond? So far, he's had more than 50,000 views on his film and 800 people agree with him in the comments section. A gun not much bigger than a credit card has got its maker into trouble. American Express has asked Trailblazer Firearms to remove anything that looks like its logo from the folding single-shot .22 lifeguard pistol. 
the size of a stack of credit cards, the pistol is designed to fit in your wallet or pocket. A Russian who sells seal meat in a can has moved into sausages. Vasily Borisov says his company produced 10,000 cans of spotted seal meat as well as seal fat and seal bacon in 2018. He now has a government grant to start production of seal sausages and pate. A deer hunter in New Zealand has pranked a McDonald's by ordering a burger with a deer carcass across his shoulders. After a successful Saturday hunting, Tehana Yeru, Teta Weru, and three friends decided to stop off at the Tome Ru Nui fast food joint for a late night snack before heading home. Wearing gumboots, stubbies and a dead deer slung over his back, the hunter tried to provoke a rise from McDonald's staff, but it looks like they've seen it all before. And finally, two piranhas have turned up in a lake popular with children. The carnivorous fish, known for their rows of sharp teeth, are normally found in the waters of the Amazon River in South America. But local residents found them in Martinswell Lake near Doncaster, South Yorkshire, where children often paddle and ducks and fish have recently gone missing. It is thought the fish may have been pets, which an owner then released into the waters when they got too big. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. News of the Pigeon and Crow ban. I urge you to have a look at the Field Sports News webpage on the fieldsportschannel.tv website, and in particular, F Channel slash General Licenses, where we are able to announce what Natural England said yesterday, uh, and which comes into force tomorrow, Thursday, the 25th of April, 2019, that the government has bowed to pressure from Chris Packham and has banned the shooting of 16 bird species. This is only in England, um, pigeons, and most crow species, Canada geese uh, and others. We're absolutely appalled at the way the announcement's been made by Natural England and quite rightly the rural community who have to let manage the land are outraged by this. We were all aware there was a legal challenge to general licences but we'd been assured by Natural England there'd be a full consultation process which of course we'd be happy to feed into but this, to do this at the drop of a hat without any form of notification at this particular time of year. This is a really key time of year for land management and pest control, not just for the shooting community, but for the farming community. Food security and crop protection is absolutely key now, particularly with lambing at this time of year. Corvid pose a huge threat to farmers at this time of year. This is absolutely outrageous. We can't understand it, and we don't see that this is how that government agencies should behave. We'll be talking to Natural England, we are talking to Natural England, and we'll be asking for answers. Uh, and we'll keep our members informed as soon as we possibly can. This all came about because of Chris Packham. He and two other animal rights activists, that's Ruth Tingay and Mark Avery, put together a, a crowd-funded scheme called Wild Justice to ask the government to uh, drop the general licences. And it appears that the government's lawyers have simply folded. What we know so far is the three licences cover 16 bird species, including several members of the crow family. That includes crows, magpies, rooks, jackdaws and jays, uh, feral and wood pigeon, and a number of invasive non-native species such as Canada geese. The specific licenses that Natural England is talking about are GLO4, which is taking and killing certain species of wild birds to prevent serious damage or disease, GLO5, uh, which is there to preserve public health or public safety, and GL06, uh, which is about conserving wild birds or flora or fauna. So it looks like you cannot go shooting from tomorrow in order to preserve public safety or to save songbirds, which are of course nesting at the moment. Details are sketchy. We don't know whether the ban includes protecting crops yet. Uh, we think it doesn't. It probably does include larson traps, so you can't catch magpies anymore. Here's what the Countryside Alliance is doing about it. This is government by consensus and uh, consultation, or is it a complete mess? Oh, it's government by cock-up, Charlie. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, and it seems as though there has been, and it's no surprise to any of us, by the way, that um, some of the work that has been done to establish the Open General Licence and, and being able to, uh, Natural England being able to delegate the authority to decide on whether, whether stuff needs to be controlled to us, the users, uh, that hasn't been done properly. Um, and uh, the, the legal challenge that has come in has highlighted 
cited that and as I understand it Natural England's legal advice is that they need to go back and to do some recent assessments of the, the need to control certain species for certain reasons and once they've done that they will be able to issue open general licences again um, but so in the meantime we've got chaos. Are they going to be able to get out of this one? I think for most species uh, and for most of the use uh, it would seem stra fairly straightforward and that makes it even more frustrating in many ways because what it means is that if, if the work can be done properly over the years and these licenses are reviewed every year, there's consultation, there's no reason it shouldn't have been done. But for instance when we're talking about um, controlling pigeons because they're damaging crops or controlling corvids because they're going after ground nesting birds, you know, these are th there is plenty of science that shows that that's necessary and therefore they shouldn't be a problem. Um, but, uh, and there shouldn't have been a problem now because that should have been done on a regular basis. So there's a real frustration there. Whether um, there's, we're able to establish, or sort of not us, Natural England are able to establish uh, a, good, a good assessment in relation to every species that's currently on the list, I'm not sure. And so we may see some changes and there may be, I hope there'll be some discussion because there hasn't been much so far. So what are the general licenses? Well, let's go back to 1979. April 1979, the EC brought out the Wild Birds Directive, which had to become law in the UK. We adopted the Wild Birds Directive as, the, uh, as part of the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act. And it was a Tory government fudge, because what nobody noticed until halfway through drafting of the Act was the EC Birds Directive banned the shooting of all migratory birds. That's pretty well all birds. There were exceptions for game birds and ducks, but pretty well everything else we've been talking about in this little piece was banned. So the Tory government said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say there's an exception to this rule. So everybody's banned from shooting everything apart from everybody. So nobody can shoot anything except everyone. They can shoot everything. There you go. Uh, they said to the shooters at the time, people like Wagby, don't worry chaps, it's a bit of a fudge, it'll roll over year to year, nobody will be any the wiser. And of course, uh, the shooting organisations accepted it at the time because government was a very clubbable thing. Well, fast forward to the 2000s and the Labour government of the day suddenly decide, suddenly discover that they could actually ban quite a lot of shooting quite easily by revoking the general licences. And in 2005, uh, I got together with the Times newspaper and we, we produced this rather horrifying piece. Uh, at the time, the best the uh, Labour government could come up with, and this is a good example of why governments should be kept very, very far away from wildlife laws, if at all possible, is that uh, you are allowed to shoot you're allowed to shoot birds as long as you try and scare them first. And that's what I'm doing in this photograph here. I'm holding up a magpie and a shotgun. I'm trying to scare the magpies before I shoot them. And that will work, won't it? Uh, and as the headline writer put it at the bottom, never mind the birds, it scared me. Now, luckily, as one civil servant told me at the time, there's one thing we, the civil service, don't like. It's being made to look like asses. So that law never came about. However, it looks like the wild justice crowdfunding exercise by Chris Packham, which raised a few tens of thousand pounds, uh, to write a single legal letter to the government, probably with uh, without prejudice written in crayon at the top, has worked. And the government lawyers have gone, all right, that's it, let's ban it then. Uh, leaving Natural England with an unholy mess to sort out. And a mess that is really gonna hurt pigeon shooters on the ground. Here's what Tom Payne, pigeon shooter, thinks of it. The news that Natural England is revoking three general licences as of Thursday the 25th has come as a complete shock to myself, the shooting community and the shooting organisations. Crops are moving into a critical period of growth. Livestock farmers have young on the ground and nesting birds with young and eggs left vulnerable. The farming industry, the shooting community, the rural community and the shooting industry have been completely let down in the communication by a governmental organisation that has not acted as would be expected. Here's that link again to find out what's going on. It's F channel slash general licences. Now let's go to something lighter. Well, lighter if you are a summer shooter and heavier if you're a snowy stalker because I have been off to see a tailor to talk about shooting suits. I have come to meet Justin Block at his home in Somerset. He makes shooting suits and he has controversial views. So I've been, had my own tailoring business for 10 years, but I've been a hunting, shooting fisherman for the best part of 50 years. So that is 50 years of experience is telling me to have a sock bottom. Sock bottom is the way forward. 
More about the sock bottom later. First, exactly what does Justin do for a living? My business is I'm a made-to-measure tailor. And what that means is one up from off the peg and one down from being a full bespoke. So customers come to me or I go to them in their homes, their offices, and I measure them up. I produce books of cloths and linings, and you can have your own cloth and your own lining made up. And then about six to seven weeks later, a suit arrives, and then I go with it and measure them up with the little pins and chalk to finish it off with a London tailor. So I make it originally, then go and fit it and hopefully get that right and then the suit is ready to go. A three-piece shooting suit from me works out at about a thousand pounds which is using several row cloths and all the best tweeds I can get but I have literally no overheads because I work out of a briefcase and I'm in a car or in a train so I keep my prices down but I keep my quality up. So I've had this made last year in the hope that this will do me to the end of my time. So it's a bit heavy, it's about an 18, 19 ounce. So the next weight down, which is the more popular weight, is 15, 16 ounces, which would be a West End tweed, really, in its weight. And those are the tweeds you tend to wear out shooting if you're wearing a shooting suit. It would be through the autumn and winter in the not too bad weather, whereas if you're up and grouse in August, and uh, I have interestingly recently done a shooting suit to a gentleman who does a lot of grouse shooting, and he had a linen suit made, a chocolate brown linen suit with a pink lining, and it was the bee's knees. It fitted fantastically. He looks fantastic. It'll last only three or four years because uh, the thing about linen is the better the quality linen, the more it creased it looks. So the minute it put on, it looked bad. The next weight up from this one, which is an 18 ounce, is about 22, 24 ounce. And I say that's pretty much bulletproof. So some of the keepers that um, on big estates and stalking people who want to wear it right through the winter, I will do a very heavy keeper's tweed type weight. Also for a bit of for hunting, that's a keeper's tweed jacket for winter hunting. Um, that's very heavy, it stands up on its own and, and it's a rat catcher coat, exactly. Yes. So this one here, this is one I'm just producing. So the customer came to me with his own lining and with his own cloth and I don't know if you can see that but there's skull and crossbones there and so I've had this, I've measured him I've sent the cloth away with all my measurements and the suit has come back now in six weeks time. Um, cut through buttonholes, little colours here, green underneath there, this is called Melton. You can have whatever colour you like. You can have your customer's initials in here. You can have pen pockets, mobile phone pockets. All these details are what I do standard. And it's a fantastic cut, a nice cloth. He's quite tall, so he's six foot. So I've gone for the three button rather than a two button because that will show his shape and length the better. Nice waistcoat with a lapel, similar to what I'm wearing today. Again, he can take his jacket off and he's still got a nice waistcoat to wear. Would you say he's a tiny bit showy, this gentleman? Uh, this is, in fact, the story is that this cloth was given to him by an uncle to wear for a particular birthday party he's going to have. And the understanding that, he, I, th I believe he, I'm making a cap as well, and his wife is having a skirt made in it. So it's a full set. The next shooting suit is one of several Justin has made for a raving syndicate of guns. Yes. So here we have a set, and it's also got breeks to go with it. So this is a full set, a shooting suit. And this was made for a team of guns up in Yorkshire. And I am making about half a dozen of them. And again, they went through my cloth books and chose these colors. Um, and it, they just didn't want to be too green or too brown. They wanted to be different. They're a team that don't have their own shoot. They're a team that travel. So they were going two different shoots. Um, and they wanted to stand out from the crowd. So I think it's come out rather nicely. You know, the purple lining is matching the stripe. Um, this again, you can have on either side, you can have the gun patches. Um, you can take pockets at the back if you want to keep cartridges. All these things can be personalized to them. Um, but it's just a rather nice tweed. So each one of them is individual and each one of them will be measured and each one of them will have the same questions asked, i.e. are you right-handed, are you left-handed, are you wanting to keep a pen, a pocket, all those sort of things are what I do when I make a suit. So it's all individually measured but they as a team have chosen one cloth to go to the team. In a shooting suit I would suggest you need to have three things. 
The first being you need to have space for movement. It's very important that a suit is obviously cut to fit, but is comfortable to wear. So a lot of people have suits that, are, that look lovely, but are just too tight. And then when they're getting over fences, getting out of cars, they just feel uncomfortable. The second thing I always say to clients is that I often get asked to make a jacket, a waistcoat and a pair of briefs, and they ask the jacket to have an action back. Now an action back is when you want to shoot and you open your arms to shoot, you have to, it gives you a little bit of extra cloth across the back, which means you've got space to open, so it's more comfortable. Is that what you've got a pleat? Yes, it's like a pleat, it's across, the, it's across your shoulder line, dropping down across your back. We can't show you one because you don't have one, do you? I don't have one, and I'll tell you why I don't have one, because I often say to clients, well that's all very nice, but actually do you shoot with the tweed jacket on? To which they reply, no, I never wear it until I'm going to have lunch afterwards. So I say, well, why don't you have a nice tweed jacket made in the three piece that you can then put on with your pair of smart shoes when you're going into the house to eat lunch. But you can also have it as a tweed jacket that you can wear in jeans and chinos. That's the action back controversy sorted out. Now let's deal with the breeks argument. There are several different cuts of breeks. Now these are some old, old breeks I have here, but what they do show is the three different types. So the first one is one I use for stalking. Now this is a much longer one. This is not just a plus two, which is two inches below the knee. This is a near a plus four or five. So this goes almost down to my boots. And if I can show you, if I put it across me, it's very long, but what it has is at the bottom of it, a very good thing, which is called a sock bottom. Now I suggest to customers that they should have all their breeks made with sock bottoms because other breeks that may have velcro which gets lots of rubbish stuck in it or buckles that can get caught in your boots and caught in the hedges with a sock bottom it is literally like the sock that you wear it comes over your calf and is tight and holds it and then you get your roll and there you are it's a very good thing to have on a pair of breeks. It's much easier to put on in the mornings and it's much safer and it's much more comfortable. Don't terribly smart people have a kind of allergy to elastic? No, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> well, that settles that. For more about Justin's made-to-measure service, visit justinblocktailoring.co.uk. Thank you, Justin. Now, from Somerset to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. A 20-year-old stalker from Ireland with the channel WD Hunter 98 sends me this, his first YouTube video, stalking a yearling fallow buck in the southeast of Ireland. Proper Irish rain on the Kiltili Hill, County Tipperary, for fox hunting on foot with hounds. It captures the atmosphere and the weather. Hunter's vermin is air rifle hunting Easter eggs and hooded crows in this film. The farm is close to lambing, so he has a go at reducing crow numbers. Well, by two. This one's in Turkish, but visually it's a good anatomy of a heart shot on a wild boar. And this one, a Spanish ibex hunt, is in English by Jonathan McGee. He also shows how, thanks to hunting management, these animals are once again thriving. Normally for bow hunting films, this channel resorts to a rifle to get rid of a livestock eating and possibly man-eating croc in Mozambique. Best of New Zealand pig hunting to music, NZ Wild Things Boar Mashup 2019 uses recent footage from the backcountry. And finally, John Bailey in the English Midlands uses a bit of tech to find a fox he shot the night before. He sends up his drone for a scan and ta-da, there it is. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, and maybe thanks to all this pigeon news you have, go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And you can pop your email address into our register page. Uh, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can back us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares for that. This kind of pigeon work does rely on people buying shares for us to be able to fund our news function. I will see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting. If there is any, of course there is. We'll just keep the pressure up through the media. Good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>